Welcome to the PCN Capital Preview. I'm Francine Scherzer. Today we'll talk with Pennsylvania's Transportation Secretary, Mike Carroll. You can join our discussion by calling us toll free at 1 877 PA 6 5001 or text us at 717 219 4001. But first, we're joined by Min Shan, reporter for Spotlight PA State College. Thanks for joining us this morning. Good to be with you. You write that many of Pennsylvania's local governments are calling for additional funding for cybersecurity. Um, just to start out, what kind of funding is currently available to them and how much additional are they seeking? In Governor Shapiro's budget proposal, we're looking at up to $25 million available for all of our state and local government units um, in the upcoming budget year. And um, a lot of the municipalities are saying that those funding, which comes from a federal grant program uh, with a limited time period to be spent out, is not enough to answer for longer term needs that they're seeing locally. Why are local governments seeing cybersecurity threats as a growing concern in recent years? There are a few things that contribute to the rising cause. Um, in a January testimony before the state legislature, a couple of the representatives from county and municipal um, units are saying that mandatory technology updates, higher insurance costs, and the rise of artificial intelligence have all added to the rising tabs that they're seeing that they have to pay out of local coffers currently. How specifically is grant money being utilized to help ward off cyber attacks? There are um, about 10 million of the federal grant money that have arrived in Pennsylvania in the past two grant years. And according to the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency, which is the state agency that administered this funding, um, about 148 local government recipients have gotten dollars for intrusion detection systems and um, another 132 awardees, which there might be some overlap of, um, also got funding for digital best practice training. So think about your uh, multi-factor authentication and just general education for staff in terms of digital security hygiene practices, as they call it. Um, so those are the kind of recipients that um, the funding has gotten to. And I think it's important to remember that we have more than 2,500 municipalities in Pennsylvania. So when you look at the number, it's, it's only a, a small portion of all the local government units that are actually receiving this help at this time. The federal government is providing $25 million in grants. What do local governments need to qualify? qualify? Um, so their uh, local governments can apply for this funding through the state agency, which is Pima. And the way that they do it is that the state, um, including the governor's office and Pima, will work with local govern governments to identify their needs. And then the state will in turn have to apply for funding from the federal government. So there is a lack in the funding arriving um, to local governments between when it leaves federal government cover to actually arriving in the hands of Pennsylvania municipalities. Um, and interestingly, I must point out that municipal authorities, which manages a lot of um, critical utilities like water and wastewater, are actually currently not eligible to receive this funding. And they are legally separate entities from your boroughs, your townships, and, and your towns. So um, that's one thing that they want federal lawmakers to consider as the money is already being dispersed, that um, they should be able to receive some of those funding as well. And once again, what are we hearing both from the Shapiro administration as well as from lawmakers regarding their willingness to dedicate funding specifically for local government cybersecurity needs? Yeah, the governor's office said that it is open to um, the suggestion coming from the uh, County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania specifically of creating a permanent line item in the state budget so that there would be uh, longer term funding coming from the state insured. Um, the governor's office says it's open to that idea, but it couldn't provide any specific timeline to when it will consider doing that, even though right now we're, we're in a budget season and CCAP does say that it wants to see it happen in the next budget. 
um, lawmakers have said that they do see cybersecurity faced by um, local governments is, is a rising threat, as we saw in Aliquiva Water Authority uh, last year and also in Bucks County's 9-11 dispatch center this year. Um, but whether they have the will to help create a permanent funding um, line out of the state budget, that is hard to say for now. Min Chian with Spotlight PA State College, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. More of the PCN Capital Preview after this short break. Welcome back. Our guest today is Pennsylvania Secretary of Transportation, Mike Carroll. Governor Josh Shapiro is proposing spending an additional $283 million on public transit in this budget. What would that mean for mass transit agencies? It would mean tremendous uh, opportunity for transit agencies across the entire state. Uh, Francine, there, there's transit in all 67 counties in our Commonwealth. Uh, most people default to the urban centers of southeastern Pennsylvania and southwestern Pennsylvania. But the reality is, is that uh, there is transit in the most rural of counties across our Commonwealth. So the governor's uh, policy suggestion for consideration with the budget this year to add $283 million uh, is really an opportunity to advance the economy of our Commonwealth uh, for the next 10 years. Where would that additional $283 million come from? It would be carved out of the existing revenue that's generated from sales tax collections across our state. Uh, currently, a portion of the sales tax revenue is de dedicated to transit. This proposal just increases that allocation from the existing tail sales tax revenue into the transit allocation. How would that funding be distributed throughout the state? Uh, by formula. There's an existing formula that exists. It, it should come as a su surprise to no one that Philadelphia and southeastern Pennsylvania, except the, the Transit Authority, gets more money than the Erie Transit Authority. Uh, more people, bigger footprint, uh, but there's a formula that uh, drives the dollars out, and that formula will be followed uh, unless there's a change to the law with respect to uh, you know, future legislation. Some lawmakers representing particularly rural counties have criticized the plan because uh, what they consider a disproportionate amount is going to SEPTA in Philadelphia. How do you get those lawmakers on board to support this plan? Well, there's always going to be more, more money that goes to SEPTA than goes to Tioga County. Mm -hmm. And the folks in Tioga County, uh, I think, are wonderfully talented people and good friends. Uh, but the reality is there are more people in southeastern Pennsylvania. And Francine, the economy of our Commonwealth is driven by the five counties uh, of southeastern Pennsylvania. 45% of the revenue that comes into the general fund uh, comes from those five counties. Uh, and if we were to hamstring them economically, it would have a detrimental effect on every single county in the state. Some lawmakers um, during the budget hearing said that they would like to see these mass transit agencies uh, make some cost-cutting measures before they would be willing to provide additional funds. Do you see places where there could be additional tightening of belts? Sure. That's always a, uh, you know, a uh, strategy for every transit agency and everybody involved with government that manages taxpayers' dollars. Uh, it, it's our responsibility as political leaders and as uh, leaders of those kinds of agencies to make sure that every dollar is used wisely. But the reality is that uh, the inflation and the capital uh, needs that exist across the, the network uh, and the opportunity to prevent, uh, you know, dialing back of routes or fare increases uh, really drives this uh, first time in 10 years additional money into public transit. So I applaud the governor and I hope that the House and Senate embrace the opportunity. If additional funding is approved, are there specific deliverables that you'd like to see mass transit agencies make, for example, additional days or hours of service? Well, sure. That, that's the, that is the goal, to make sure that people can get to work, to the doctor's office, to the other appointments that they may have. Um, and it really is more than just an agency that provides a, a shared ride for seniors in our state, which is important. But it does, transit provides people the opportunity to get to work and to school. Uh, and those folks are, uh, you know, active members of the, uh, of the workforce of the Commonwealth, uh, and they rely on transit uh, in a great way. What happens to these mass transit agencies if additional funding does not get approved? Then there's the prospect for fare increases or the uh, reduction of routes or both. Uh, and that would be uh, very harmful, as I said, uh, not just in southeastern Pennsylvania, but across the entire state. How have mass transit agencies been affected as a result of COVID? Well, of course, ridership declined during COVID. Uh, it has slowly uh, uh, returned um, in some arenas. For example, the Pennsylvanian, that is transit uh, uh, passenger rail from Pittsburgh to Harrisburg to Philly, uh, it's back to full 100% ridership. Uh, the transit agencies uh, in our urban centers, Allentown and Scranton and, and Philadelphia, uh, around 70, 75% pre-COVID, uh, and the numbers are increasing. A reminder to our viewers, if you would like to join in on our discussion today with Secretary Carroll, please call us toll-free at 1-877-PA-6-5001 or text us your question to 
219-4001. Now, as we're talking about mass transit, um, in recent months we've heard concerns regarding safety, particularly in southeastern Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. Who's responsible for overseeing safety enhancements? Is that something that PennDOT has a hand in, or is that strictly city? Well, what's happening in Philadelphia is tragic in many ways with the, uh, uh, the, the challenges with respect to safety. Uh, I would offer it's not Philadelphia unique. Uh, every major city in the United States has that same challenge. Uh, there is, uh, you know, an ongoing uh, debate relative to additional enforcement activities in southeastern Pennsylvania as a result of a change in the law in the last administration. Uh, but uh, it, the challenge is for the city of Philadelphia, for the Philadelphia Police Department, uh, for all involved uh, to make sure that uh, efforts to enhance safety are stepped up. Looking at the budget overall, last year's budget included transitioning beginning the shift of state police funding going from the motor license fund to the general fund. How is that transition going? Uh, it really uh, well, and it's an important transition, uh, Francine. At uh, our high water mark, PennDOT was transferring over $800 million a year to the state police from the motor license fund. Uh, for context, that's about 13 cents a gallon, real money out of the motor license fund to support the Pennsylvania state police. And of course, I like uh, the, the governor and all political leaders are tremendous advocates for the state police. But the reality is we should have been funding them out of the general fund. Uh, when Governor Shapiro was, uh, uh, was sworn in, uh, the amount being transferred was about $500 million. Uh, the governor's uh, proposal is to reduce that by $125 million each year for four years. Last year, the first $125 million was decoupled. Uh, this June, it's my hope and expectation that the second $125 million will be re, re, uh, decoupled, and that will allow that additional money to be put back into our road and bridge network, and the state police get fully funded out of the general fund so they do not get a reduction. In fact, they'll get an increase in allocation based on uh, the appropriation last year out of the general fund for the state police. Can you talk a little bit more in detail about how that additional funding is being utilized within PennDOT? Sure. It's, it's, uh, it's road and bridge money. Uh, for context, uh, the money that goes into the motor license fund uh, cannot be used for transit uh, or the other modes. It has to be used for roads and bridges. Uh, and so that $125 million last year with another $125 million this year, so $250 million, uh, adds that to our program, as we call it, which is the money that we spend to, for our uh, construction projects across the state. Uh, and, and that $250 million this year will make a difference. State Representative Ed Nielsen is proposing a, to charge a fee for drivers of electric vehicles to make up for the loss in gas tax revenue. Has PennDOT taken a position on this proposal? Uh, it's ab absolutely something we have to consider. It's important to make sure that we uh, incent people to continue on the path of purchasing electric vehicles uh, because the, uh, the effect that they have on our environment will matter. Uh, we are in the process now of building out charging stations across the interstate network as a result of money that we received from the U.S. Congress and, and Pre President Biden. And so that charge out will advance the uh, proliferation of electric vehicles. General Motors and Ford and others are talking about a much greater percentage of their fleet being electric vehicles. And so uh, having those folks participate in the motor license fund, p purchasers of hybrid electric or plug-in electric, uh, is going to be a conversation that uh, I expect that we'll have this year. Since you talked about the expansion of electrical, electric vehicle charging stations, how expansive will that growth of charging stations be throughout the state? A significant. First one uh, in the state was opened in Luzerne County along I-81. Uh, it was the second or third in the nation as a result of the federal transportation bill, depending on how you score what New York did. Um, and so we're proud of the team at PennDOT that's leading the effort with respect to the build out of those charging stations. Uh, there'll be gaps no greater than 50 miles uh, on the interstate network and some other interstate lookalikes. Uh, and then there will, and that's just the first uh, two rounds of funding uh, as a result of the federal money. There'll be three additional rounds, uh, all in about $175 million uh, from the federal government. And we will have a charging station network that will probably advance the, uh, the uh, population of electric vehicles on our fleet. Who decides where those charging stations are based? What PennDOT's team does is, as a result of our coordination with the FHWA. Uh, in many ways, uh, a lot of the money that PennDOT utilizes, and in fact, all of the money from, for the, uh, it's called NEVI, uh, is federal money. So the FHWA has, a, uh, has oversight with respect to our allocation of those dollars. Uh, and so it's a very competitive process where uh, entities that, that are predictable in so many ways, you know, truck stops and, and convenience stores and such uh, along the interstate network were applicants in the first two rounds. It will get more uh, nuanced going forward because there'll be some charging stations in communities and such, uh, but we haven't got to that point yet. What are the benefits of enhancing the access to charging stations? Uh, 
Well, just making sure that people feel comfort, a comfort level that they can get from point A to point B. Um, right now, there is a network of charging stations that exist, but I wouldn't describe it as aggressive uh, and robust. Uh, the resulting uh, investment from the $175 million will result in charging stations that uh, uh, people will have a comfort level that they're not going to you know, be left high and dry. So uh, if we could go back for a moment to Representative Nielsen's proposal to mm -hmm. charge a tax for people that have electric vehicles. Currently, owners of electric vehicles are supposed to log how much electricity their vehicle uses. Can you talk a little bit about that and how much is actually being remitted compared to how many owners uh, of electric vehicles there are in the Commonwealth? Uh, it's not an ideal program. The uh, current uh, uh, alternative fuels tax is self-imposed, uh, where a person needs to keep track of the kilowatt hours that they uh, utilize for the charging of their vehicle, uh, do a math equation, fill out a form, so to check to the Department of Revenue. Uh, I would offer that that system is probably not being uh, utilized, and I don't blame uh, in so many ways the folks that do that at home to charge their electric vehicles. Uh, Representative Nielsen uh, and uh, Representative, or Senator Rothman, I believe, in the Senate, mm -hmm. uh, and I would just modestly say it's, it's a registration fee that they're talking about, not so much a tax. And so the reg fee would be paid just on top of the existing registration fee for those vehicles. Have you noticed uh, a marked reduction in the gas tax revenue as people have, you know, electric vehicles and even hybrids have grown in popularity? Slow decline this year. Uh, the best way that you uh, you can see it uh, uh, establish itself is the payment to the communities. Every single community in our state gets a liquid fuel allocation, which is their share of the gas tax revenue. And this year there was a modest decline, uh, you know, a very modest decline. But it is the beginning uh, of the decline that will continue, I think, for the next number of years because of the proliferation of these vehicles. And so uh, there'll be a test somewhere in the future with respect to how we backfill those dollars. I'm not sure that the registration fee increase on electric and hybrid electrics is going to be enough, uh, but a conversation that will uh, have to be, uh, you know, advanced in the General Assembly, uh, you know, in the coming years. Are there other proposals currently in the General Assembly aimed at bringing in additional revenue perhaps to make up for the decline in the gas tax? I haven't seen any that I can speak to off the top of my head. None that, that have any serious traction right now. The one that has the traction is this registration fee, uh, enhanced registration fee for hybrid electric and plug-in electric. During the budget hearings, another issue that came up um, were costs related to snow removal contracts. Why is PennDOT currently not able to directly employ snow removal? We've had rented equipment for a long time at Pendleton, so this is nothing new. Uh, the challenge for us, especially now in the urban centers in Southeast PA and Lancaster County and others, is the uh, inability to attract folks to, to our workforce. Uh, we have challenges with respect to hiring folks to come work for PennDOT. That's from uh, CDL truck drivers all the way to civil engineers. And so uh, in an effort to make sure that the roads are safe and passable uh, during the winter, uh, we have employed rented equipment. Uh, but again, that, that has happened at PennDOT for a long time. How much is Pennsylvania receiving? You, you talked about the federal infrastructure bill um, and the, the expansion of the electric vehicle charging stations. Can you talk a little bit more about how much Pennsylvania is receiving and how else that money is being utilized? So on the road and bridge side, in the federal bill, the IIJA, as it's called, or BIL, uh, directed uh, program dollars to all 50 states. Uh, and the program dollars uh, on the road and bridge side for Pennsylvania is, uh, over the course of five years, about $5 billion, maybe four and a half. Um, and so uh, the way that uh, you can notice the increase is that our program of road and bridge projects went from about $2.2 billion to about $2.9 billion. And so that $700 million represents the road and bridge additional funds that came to Pennsylvania. Uh, beyond that, uh, there were allocations from the federal bill to other modes of transportation, transit agencies, the Port of Philadelphia, airports across our state. Uh, and so uh, that also uh, goes into the world of transportation. And then thirdly, there are discretionary uh, funds available as a result of the federal bill that Pennsylvania has been, been the recipient of uh, discretionary funds from those, uh, from those sources, and we will continue to do that to maximize the amount of money that PennDOT gets as a result of the federal bill. Can you talk a little bit about the economic impact of that bill in Pennsylvania, particularly are additional jobs being created as a result of these additional projects? Well, sure. I mean, it, you, you, the, the, the projects that we do, road and bridge projects, require actual workers on the ground, and, uh, and you know, they're wildly talented, and, and it was on full display last summer in Philadelphia.
Philadelphia. Um, but the additional federal money, $700 million, uh, it makes a huge difference to our program. Uh, those projects will uh, exhibit in all 67 counties. Uh, and so the additional $700 million, if you were to pinpoint where exactly those dollars were spent, um, even though it may not have been spent in Luzerne County, uh, Luzerne County's projects would be the beneficiary because the pressure is relieved in the balance of the program because of those additional funds. Since you just referred to Philadelphia, um, PennDOT had made national headlines a little over a year ago um, for the quick repair of I-95 in Philadelphia. Can you talk a little about, perhaps more broadly, about the progress that PennDOT is making in repairing uh, bridges in particular? Because I know um, that has been something in the headlines. Even prior to that, there was a bridge collapse in Pittsburgh roughly about a year and a half ago. Yeah, that was the Fern Hollow Bridge that collapsed. Mm -hmm. and the, uh, the nuance there is that that was the city of Pittsburgh Bridge. I mean, mm -hmm. there are bridges across our Commonwealth. The average person cares little about whose bridge it is. They mm -hmm. just want to make sure it's safe. But there are uh, bridges that PennDOT owns, and then there are bridges that local governments have, and then there are railroad bridges and some other uh, entities that have bridges. Uh, it, it is a real challenge. Many of the bridges... Uh, PennDOT has uh, 25,000 bridges. Uh, it's a big number. Uh, many of them are over 50 years old, past their useful life. Uh, and uh, we do our level best to make sure that we direct uh, adequate resources to, uh, to replace those that need to be replaced, uh, repair those that are in need of repair. Uh, but it's a big challenge. Uh, the, the, uh, the numbers are challenging when it comes to make sure that we have uh, the ability to attack projects uh, that uh, demand our attention. Uh, and thankfully, the federal bill has helped us in that regard. This is the time of year where PennDOT workers would be perhaps a little bit more visible as summer construction begins to, to take shape. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about where viewers can go if they have questions or they see a big project on the horizon in their neighborhood? Where can they learn more about what's happening? Well, sure. PennDOT's website and then the, each of the engineering districts across our state uh, have, project, have information related to the projects in their region. Uh, I wouldn't expect people to know the, uh, the engineering district that they mm -hmm. live in, but uh, you know, a quick examination of PennDOT's website and uh, knowledge of what county you live in or what community would get you to the exact right uh, uh, page, and then you could uh, learn for yourself about projects that are underway or on the horizon. Are there any particular big projects that Pennsylvanians should be aware of, perhaps, in our, in our big cities? Uh, well, in, in almost all of our cities and regions, there are big projects underway. Right here in Harrisburg, the I-83 project mm -hmm. from the Susquehanna River uh, Toward 81, uh, the Eisenhower Boulevard uh, uh, it, it area is under under construction. Uh, in northeastern Pennsylvania, the twin bridges in Roaring Brook, uh, over, uh, you know, over a hundred million dollar project. Uh, those kinds of projects exist throughout our state. In central Pennsylvania, in Northumberland County, the uh, uh, central Susquehanna Thruway, uh, partially complete, but uh, the area leading out to Shamokin Dam remains under construction. So uh, it, Bayfront Parkway in Erie, I can go on, Francine. There mm -hmm. are so many. Uh, every region of the state has projects that are underway. Um, and the sadness for me is that most of those, so many of those projects would have been done if not for that tran uh, transfer of funds to the state police. Uh, that was a policy decision that uh, really uh, slowed down the delivery of some projects that should have been delivered by now. Let's talk a little bit about rail safety now. In uh, just a little over the past year, there have been two Norfolk Southern derailments. Um, more recently, one in Northampton County, um, and obviously many uh, know about the one in East Palestine, which is just over the state's border in western PA. Mm -hmm. What's been done to improve safety since the, the East Palestine accident? Well, when it comes to railroads, the Interstate Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution uh, prohibits the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania or local jurisdictions from imposing regulations mm -hmm. on the rail, railroads. So it really is up to the U.S. Congress and the President to advance uh, legislation that would change the current regiment when it comes to uh, the operation of rail. Railroads and uh, there are there are bills. Uh, one in particular, uh, a Senate bill sponsored by Pennsylvania Senator Senator Fetterman and a Senator from Ohio, whose name I don't recall. Uh, but I don't think that bill has received uh, final consideration vote yet. But I'm hopeful that it does. Has your agency had an opportunity to provide testimony or give any input um, as these regulations are being considered? I, I, it's changes to the law, so I'm not aware of anybody from Penda that would have testified. Again, the state, uh, the, the accident in East Palestine was in a, in a different jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I know that uh, the members of Congress uh, and the two U.S. senators, I visited East Palestine. I was in Darlington Township uh, in Beaver County. That was the closest Pennsylvania community to the accident. Uh, I think there's general consensus that uh, an upgrade to the regulations with respect to the operation of railroads is important. I'm hopeful that Congress advances it. In February, the Associated Press reported that one-third of the rail industry's jobs have been cut. Does that make rail travel and transport less safe? Oh, I sure hope not. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the reality is that people that live near railroads, and there are 
the tens of thousands of folks that, that have that scenario uh, deserve to make sure to deserve the uh, peace of mind to know that, uh, that the railroads are being operated in the safest way possible. Uh, I doubt that there's a way that anybody could declare 100 percent guarantee that there'll never be an accident. But there are steps that can be made uh, and changes that can be made that would advance the interest of safety. Uh, admittedly, it may come with some more costs for the railroad. It may come with more of a hassle. But the important step, I think, that's necessary is to ensure the folks that live near those railroads uh, have the highest level of comfort that they could have. Can you also talk a little bit about the expansion of rail in Pennsylvania? There's a particularly some expansion um, going through the Scranton area that's made headlines in recent months. Uh, three, in fact. Uh, the, the federal transportation bill offered uh, uh, $66 billion nationwide through the Federal Railroad Administration for enhanced passenger rail. Uh, Pennsylvania was the recipient of three different uh, corridor ID approvals. Uh, Pittsburgh to Harrisburg. Uh, you may recall that there were lots of uh, legislators, House and Senate members that wanted to see additional passenger rail service between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. Uh, that was one of the corridors that was approved. Uh, that one also came with the bonus of $142 million grant to help build out the, uh, uh, the assets necessary to provide that service. Uh, that's a line that's shared with Norf Norfolk Southern, so there needs to be an accommodation for passenger rail and freight. Uh, two other corridors were approved, Reading to Philadelphia and Scranton to New York City. Uh, and I have uh, uh, great optimism that there's prospects for success with both of those projects. I know the governor is uh, wildly supportive of an enhanced passenger rail uh, in those corridors. Um, and then there's a, there's a, uh, a, a you know, budding effort in the Allentown area to, to restore passenger rail service from the Lehigh Valley to New York City as well. Let's give Secretary Carroll a brief break so I can tell you about what's upcoming on PCN. The PCN Capital Preview returns tomorrow morning as we discuss the recent state budget hearings with House Appropriations Committee Chairs, Representatives Jordan Harris and Seth Grove. That's tomorrow morning, live at 9 o'clock. Join us for On the Issues this week as we sit down with candidates in the April primary election. We'll be joined by Rob Mercury, a Republican seeking to serve Congressional District 17. Democrats Keir Bradford Gray and Jack Stolsteimer, both candidates for Attorney General and Aaron McClelland, a Democrat running for state treasurer. That's Wednesday night, starting at 7. Tune in for live coverage of the PIAA Basketball Championships at the Giant Center in Hershey, starting this Thursday afternoon at 12 noon and running through Saturday. Check PCN's website for schedule details. All the great public affairs event coverage and interviews you watch on PCN are now available for free online at PCNTV.com and on PCN Select. Thank you for watching PCN. PCN is a 501c3 nonprofit television network that re receives no state or government funding. We're relying on viewers and donors like you to help PCN continue to bring you everything Pennsylvania. To make a donation, visit PCNTV.com. And one more reminder to viewers, if you'd like to join in on our discussion today, our toll-free number is 1-877-PA-65001, or you can text us 717-219-4001. Um, let's move on and talk about safety. Earlier this month, state police began to enforce Work Zone Speed, the Speed Safety Camera Program. What should viewers know about the program? Well, it's a, it's a continuation of the program that we had uh, as a pilot for the last five years. Uh, the pilot uh, language was expiring at the end of last calendar year. Uh, thankfully, the General Assembly approved an extension uh, of the program, and so uh, it's uh, you know a, a camera, a remote a camera that is uh, situated in a work zone, uh, takes a picture of the license plate of the vehicle as it passes if it's greater than 10 miles over the limit, uh, and really, Francine, it's an effort to try and slow folks down. Um, you know, the, not every work zone is separated by a Jersey barrier. Some of the uh, live traffic and workers are separated by an orange cone. Uh, and for those folks that do that job, which is something that we all rely on, uh, they deserve to be able to make it home at night. And to have people uh, excessively speeding in those work zones really is dangerous for the workers. It's also uh, bad for the drivers as well, and the motorists that uh, could result in an accident. But we really do have to take that step, and it's, and it's proved wildly successful. Uh, the data shows that vehicles have slowed down in work zones, uh, and so I'm thrilled, uh, as I know so many of the contractors and their workers are thrilled with the extension of that program. As you mentioned, this was a five-year pilot program first. What did you learn in that first five years? 
that we needed to slow folks down. Mm -hmm. They were going too fast in work zones. And, and I know it's human nature uh, that, uh, you know, you enter a work zone and maybe you ease up a little bit on the gas, but uh, we really did need to have slow folks slow down. There have been uh, too many accidents in work zones. I mean, the, the nature of the work zone results in a more narrow lane, uh, more congestion, because uh, two lanes of traffic often merge into one. Um, and, you know, I, I understand people are busy and they want to get where they're going, but uh, those workers that are standing in live traffic, essentially, just separated by an orange cone, uh, really are at risk and, and uh, having that kind of speed it just has the it sets the table for uh, catastrophic accidents that we'd like to avoid what finds their association with violations in this program? Uh, well, there's a, the, uh, the first offense is a warning, and then the second offense is a, is a $75 fine, and it graduates from there. Uh, that we, our experience has been that not too many people get to the uh, second, third, and fourth uh, notice of violation. Uh, most uh, folks, after they have their uh, warning, uh, get the message that it's time to slow down to the work zones. Um, every now and then, some of them get to the second offense, but it's pretty rare to get beyond that. A uh, separate program earlier this year, the Shapiro administration invested in several red light camera enforcements. Can you talk a little bit about that program? Uh, also an existing program that was uh, primarily on the uh, Roosevelt Boulevard, Route 1 in Philadelphia, uh, in an effort to slow folks down. That is a very, very dangerous highway, probably the most dangerous highway in, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, many uh, unfortunate tragic accidents on Roosevelt. Uh, and so it was an effort to try and uh, slow folks down, both with red light cameras and with the uh, speed enforcement cameras. Uh, and they will populate in some of the other areas beyond just uh, Roosevelt Boulevard going forward. Uh, they won't be across the entire state, but uh, uh, targeted areas that just to slow folks down and, and keep people safe. Pedestrians, vulnerable highway, highway users deserve to be able to take advantage of our network as well. People who are uh, pedestrians or who ride bicycles, uh, they deserve a level of protection as well. And often uh, their uh, usage of our uh, network d demands that we take extra steps. How effective is this program in reducing people running red lights? Same, same as the work zones. Uh, it has proven effective. The data uh, suggests that uh, it has made a difference. Uh, it is not intended in any way to be a money-making uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, the reality is in so many of these programs, we lose dollars. Uh, but it's a, it's a wise investment to slow folks down. Let's head to our phones now. Robert is calling from Clearfield. Go ahead, sir. Okay, good morning, Mr. Secretary. You know, Mr. Secretary, it, for people living in this area, the Clearfield, it uh, doesn't matter whether you're 80 years old or 8 years old. You're never going to live, he said, to see 219 or finishing to New York. Yet we see these massive improvements from State College East. Of course, we know it's the powers to be uh, in Harrisburg, as far as they're concerned. Uh, Pennsylvania's westernmost border is the Milesburg Interchange of Interstate 80. So from that standpoint, he said, uh, and, if you, and there is a growing resentment. It seems like whatever Penn State wants, Penn State gets. Now, as we see, as said, these areas continue to be the focus of sort of major improvements, yet we see nothing. So the question is, is if, you know, why not just level with us and tell us that we really have nothing to look forward to in that middle third of Pennsylvania? That's my question, sir. Thank you for your time. Sure. Uh, I, I, I would uh, beg to differ uh, with the caller. I mean, I was at uh, the Route 322 uh, bridge improvement project in Clearfield County uh, uh, late last year, uh, use of federal dollars to advance that bridge project. Uh, and the reference to 219 uh, from Maryland to New York uh, is fair. Uh, we are underway with 219 uh, from Maryland uh, to the Johnstown area. Uh, it would be my preference to have 219 extend all the way to New York State. And, and, but the reality is that uh, we just don't have the resources to do that in one big chunk. We don't, uh, we, you know, we do projects in, in phases just uh, so that we could take smaller bites on, on the project. But Clearfield County, like Jefferson County, like Clarion County, I've been to those counties. I'm familiar with what their transportation needs are. Uh, you know, it, it likely Philadelphia and Montgomery County will always have more. There's more people and there's more, uh, there's more of a network there. But I can tell you that Clarion, Clearfield County uh, is not ignored by PennDOT nor by me. Uh, and we will continue to build out the network to make sure that the folks in rural PA have a net network that they can be proud of as well. I'll ask this on a very broad basis. What opportunities do Pennsylvanians have to provide comments or suggestions uh, regarding transportation patterns in their own region, whether it's regarding an anticipated project or a situation that's been ongoing? Well, all of the projects require uh, public participation, mm -hmm. public meetings, and public input, whether it's in person or whether it's online. Uh, and so the uh, the federal uh, rules and laws demand that. Uh, PennDOT's happy to do that. Uh, and the comments that are submitted by the public are taken quite seriously. 
uh, and we do our level best to try and accommodate uh, the needs of a community. Uh, it, it's, it's nearly an impossibility to make, uh, uh, deliver a project and have every single person uh, applaud. Uh, you know, everybody has a different perspective on things, uh, but we, uh, we do uh, welcome uh, and advance participation by the public in all of our projects. Now, a moment ago, we were talking about some different sa safety pri pilot programs and enhancements. There have been changes regarding the automated school bus enforcement. Can you talk about what's involved in the program and what changes have come down the path? So th that one's nuanced. The, the, uh, there has been a program that uh, has been in place where a, a school district can uh, employ a school a camera that would capture the license plate of a vehicle that passes a school bus with the flashing of red lights and the arm extended. Uh, then there's a notice of violation that would have been sent to the owner of the vehicle. Um, and then the process to dispose of that set notice of violation would be in the local magistrate's office. Uh, the change in the law that came in December uh, removed the magistrate component of that and now a notice of violation received by a vehicle owner for uh, the vehicle passing a school bus. Uh, if somebody wants to take an appeal of that notice, uh, then the hearing officer would be in PennDOT, uh, similar to what we have now with high-speed hearings for people that exceed the speed limit by a, a certain, by over 30 miles an hour uh, or by uh, accumulation of points on their driver record. So it's a little nuanced. It, uh, it frees up the magistrates from having an additional uh, uh, workload uh, for these notices of violation. Uh, and so the the change of the law set that in motion where PennDOT now will dispose of those citations, a notice of violation upon an appeal. Uh, let's move on and talk about driver's licenses. The House Transportation Committee is considering whether or not to allow Pennsylvania drivers to carry a digital driver's license. Mm -hmm. Has PennDOT taken a position on this? Uh, PennDOT is happy to uh, ad advance the conversation. Uh, I know many other states have had that conversion. Uh, it, when it comes to driver licenses generally in Pennsylvania, uh, PennDOT is not the sole decider of whether or not mm -hmm. to be in favor of a bill. Uh, the Pennsylvania State Police, of course, enforce Title 75, the vehicle code. Uh, and so for any uh, effort to change the way the driver's Driver's products are delivered or utilized. Uh, PennDOT and the state police, along with the, uh, you know, of course, the administration, need to make sure that we're in alignment with respect to any changes that are proposed. In other states that have a digital driver's license, is there still a physical license issued as well? Oh, I think so. I'm, although I wouldn't want to uh, put my hand in the Bible for that mm -hmm. one. I don't know what, uh, what's going on in every state, but uh, uh, my suspicion is is that uh, as technology advances, uh, as uh, people my generation uh, age for forward. Mm -hmm. uh, the younger generation is going to insist upon digital products like that. Uh, it's not going to be a surprise to me that we get to a point somewhere down the road where digital driver's licenses and digital vehicle registrations uh, are a thing. We already have digital uh, insurance uh, credentials that uh, can be utilized for folks when they're pulled over on the side of the road by a police officer. So uh, it seems uh, quite likely that we're heading in that direction. On another topic, a trio of Philadelphia representatives are proposing to allow illegal immigrants to obtain a Pennsylvania driver's license. Is PennDOT taking a position on this? So undocumented immigrants. And uh, the, the, again, when it comes to this, uh, the, the Pennsylvania State Police have to, uh, be, have to have a comfort level with the products that are being issued. I know the legislation that was introduced in past sessions and this session uh, has some problematic language with respect to uh, uh, oversight by law enforcement. Uh, it's going to be uh, important for uh, a reconciliation of the need to, to have law enforcement do their job uh, and recognize the needs of undocumented immigrants as well. Is this opportunity made available in other states? Yes. Let's talk a little bit about Real ID. Where does Real ID fall into that discussion? So Real ID is a federal requirement uh, you know, imposed upon the 50 states. Uh, in, in so many ways, I think the Pennsylvania driver's license that existed was a Real ID, mm -hmm. um, but the, the federal government wanted an enhanced level of uh, documentation to issue a, a, this a, a driver's license. And so uh, we have about 20 percent of the folks in our uh, universe of drivers that have the Real ID. Uh, the federal government uh, is, has extended the uh, the period of time where they will allow folks to get on a commercial a flight without the Real ID. But we're, I think, getting to the point where the extensions will come to an end. Uh, and in the fall of next year, my expectation is, is that folks will have to have a Real ID or a passport to board a commercial flight. Uh, and because human nature is such that it is, I think there'll be an uptick as we get closer and there's more of a uh, conversation uh, in the uh, atmosphere of the United States that people need to have this real ID if they don't have a passport, if they're going to fly. You're now in a role as a secretary, as an agency secretary. Previously, you served as a state lawmaker. Mm -hmm. um, as you went through the budget hearings in recent weeks, 
how will your role be different this time around um, as the budget is coming together? Will you be actively lobbying for a, additional funding on behalf of the governor's proposed mass transit fun, uh, funding? Yes, we, I, I've done events in York and Westmoreland County and expect to do others uh, advancing the conversation and reminding folks that uh, transit is important in, ca in counties like York and like Westmoreland, uh, obviously important in the five counties in SEPTA's footprint, uh, obviously important in Allegheny County and uh, southwestern Pennsylvania, uh, but the, the governor's proposal also does present us an opportunity, and I'm happy to have that conversation across the state. Uh, as I have uh, had the conversation relative to the decoupling of the state police dollars, uh, again, uh, the, those uh, state the state police will be fully funded out of the general fund where they probably should have been funded, and that freed up money will give PennDOT the ability to deliver even more projects, including in Clearfield County. Secretary Mike Carroll, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. PCN's Ellen Franz spoke earlier with Pennsylvania's Independent Fiscal Office Director Matthew Niddle about the state budget. Welcome to our program. All For right, those who may be unfamiliar, can you explain some of the duties of your office? Sure, our main duties for the independent fiscal office is we make budget projections for use in the state budget process. Generally, we make those one year ahead of time, but oftentimes we do that five years ahead of time. Based off of an article from PennLive, they listed that your office's revenue projections were 1.1 billion less than the Shapiro mm -hmm. administration's. Why the difference in numbers? Yeah, the main difference in the, the numbers we have for next fiscal year, that's fiscal year 24-25, deals with corporate net income taxes. Um, Pennsylvania currently collects about $6 billion in those tax sources. Uh, my office thinks that corporate profits are going to slow down a bit here, where the Shapiro administration believes that they're going to uh, further increase by 5%. So that's the, the main uh, difference between our two forecasts. Uh, we have a little slower growth. Uh, they have a little faster growth, but most of that is due to corporate profits. So what do you look at to get these numbers, like you said, the corporate numbers? Yeah, we both use the same, what we call a macroeconomics provider. This is S&P Global Insight, and they will provide a forecast. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have one for Pennsylvania for profits. We get a, a U.S. forecast. So we're both looking at the same U.S. forecast, but uh, S&P Global Insight will provide multiple profit forecasts, um, it, it, kind of different cuts of the data, if you will. So while we're looking at the same uh, data source, there are slightly different profits measures that give uh, one says a 5% growth rate and one has flat percent flat growth for next year. And my office thinks based on what we're seeing in real time that the flat growth for next year is more representative. So will this discrepancy matter in the long run if the governor's budget is passed as is? Yes, it could matter. So for for next year for corporate profits, the differential is about half a billion dollars. And of course, uh, once you have a differential in the first year, uh, it builds upon itself in all future years. So uh, the $500 million, or as you noted, a, a total of $1 billion, uh, that kind of opens up to a larger difference in all future years uh, and compounds, if you will. In his budget address, Governor Shapiro proposed raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. How would this increase affect the finances of the state? Yeah, so my office is uh, required to undertake an analysis of that proposal and the other proposals such as marijuana legalization, and we'll put that document out next, uh, at the end of this month, excuse me. Uh, we think that the proposal will generate additional tax revenues, much like the administration does. They think it's going to generate about $115 million in additional tax revenues. We're probably about half of that. And the reason it generates additional monies is because we're shifting income down to lower income folks. They tend to spend all of their money and therefore gives the uh, economy a little kick. Uh, on the other side though, my office also thinks that we'll have uh, lower employment from the higher minimum wage on the order of about 20,000 fewer positions. You mentioned the legalization of marijuana. That was something the governor also proposed in his budget address. I know that your office was looking into how that affects the finances of other states where it is legalized, how would that impact Pennsylvania? Yeah, so another proposal that we'll be uh, analyzing this the end of this month, but what we're seeing right now, and the way we approach this is we do look at other states, and there's a lot of other states now that we have good data on about how much money they're generating. 
what we'll do is we'll look at how much they're generating on a per capita basis, you know, based on their population. And then we'll look at the tax rate that's proposed by the governor, and that's 20% on the wholesale price. The governor currently has an estimate, I believe, of $166 million uh, just in excise taxes, and then another, I think, 70 or 80 million in sales tax. Uh, we think it could be a bit more than that, depending on, on our analysis, but we think that's a conservative estimate that potentially, uh, if this proposal does go forward, it could generate in total uh, possibly 250 to $300 million per year. Matthew Niddle, Director of the State Independent Fiscal Office, thank you for your time. Thank you. That concludes today's show. On the next episode of the PCN Capital Preview, we'll talk about the state budget with chairs of the House Appropriations Committee, Representatives Jordan Harris and Seth Grove. That's tomorrow, starting live at 9 a.m. I'm Francine Scherzer. Thank you for watching.